calling the uh, meeting of the Arlington Finance Committee to order. Uh, our major business today is a presentation by the Capital Planning Committee. And uh, I'll turn the presentation over to the new chair, sir. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for indulging the technical difficulties. Uh, so good evening. Thank you for, ha for having us. And uh, we thought we would kick off with a before picture of the DPW. Uh, we do not have an after picture yet or even a rendering of that, but here we go. So Could today, you uh, perhaps introduce the I'm, head That's head bingo. So okay. here we are today, our attendees, and I'll ask uh, each of us to raise his or her hand when I say, say their names. So Joe Barr, Ida Cody, Charlie Foskett, Bill Marshall, Michael Mason, Chris Moore, Angela Olszewski, Sandy Cooler, Julie Wayman, and me, Timor Kai Yantar. All right, great. So we have tonight's agenda, um, a little bit on who we are, what we do, and what we're asking you to do tonight. Then we'll talk about what the capital plan um, has achieved or is currently achieving, uh, and how it fits into our town's budget. We'll go into some detail on the main recommended appropriations by department. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some issues that came up this year and that we expect will be recurring and possibly contentious and costly going forward. Then we have some, some uh, detail from the town's treasurer on how we must rescind prior borrowing and on reappropriations. And finally, a recap and the recommended vote. So this is our membership. Um, and it uh, includes a few of us who couldn't be here tonight, uh, Stephen Andrew and Brian Merrick. Uh, it shows how we all came to be on, on this committee. Here we have how we divide up our work. We have several subcommittees, and each of them meets with a few of the town's departments in the fall to go over their requests, and then we discuss them as a full <coughs> committee. Before I go into the work that we do, um, let's take a step back into why are we doing this? So capital expenditures are for long-lived assets, often costly ones that the town must borrow to pay for. It therefore naturally leads itself to long-term planning. By creating a plan, we reduce uncertainty. We can also weigh priorities, uh, which is necessary in order to keep within our, our budget. And finally, having this dedicated group pay careful attention to these matters should, we hope, reassure, reassure our citizens. So for many of you, this should be familiar, but there's always new members, so here's a re refresher on our process. Uh, we look at the town's year-by-year -year revenues and allocate 5% of that for capital expenditures. And these are for non-exempt spending. We don't count the exempt spending. Uh, the most uh, clear example of that currently is the high school. It's the kind that's authorized by citizens in debt exclusion votes. Uh, it creates a separate pool of money paid for by extra taxes uh, for, a, uh, for a finite project. So that's aside from what we do. We then ask the town's departments to tell us <coughs> um, in the summertime, after the new um, fiscal year begins, um, what their requests are. And that's both for the fiscal year that will begin the following summer, July 1st, as well as for the following four years. Uh, these are submitted uh, through early September, which is when we begin meeting as a committee. Uh, we then have those subcommittees you saw before meet with the department heads um, to discuss their requests in detail. Uh, we also meet with facilities regarding the upkeep of the physical plant. So for example, time for a new roof on whatever building. Uh, we then have the subcommittee present to the full committee uh, and we approve or not the, uh, the requests and prioritize them. And we also look to, to balance the spending within the 5% rule that we'll come back to um, over the full five-year plan. Um, I want to say a few words of praise for former chair Charlie Foskett and some of our other um, committee members, such as uh, Stephen Andrew and Brian Rarig, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, with their leadership, uh, our capital plan has been successful and in budget for, for 33 years and counting. Uh, and adhering to the 5% rule has met the town's needs. Uh, while also providing guardrails so we don't spend too little or more likely too much. Uh, why is it 5%? First of all, it's worked as, an, as, as an, a number. Second, it's been a number that doesn't change, so we can keep that as that, um, as that guide rail, as, as I called it. 
and it's uh, in line with what we had seen at other towns around um, the Commonwealth. So tonight we are asking you to vote favorable action on our recommended budget and reappropriation of, of funds to support our five-year plan um, to transfer, this is a, a bit of a detail, transfer $10,000 from perpetual care to our capital budget and to support uh, a separate article from the treasurer on debt rescission. With that background, I'll turn it over to Sandy Tuller, our deputy town manager, to look at the capital plan's achievements and to put it into context in our current budget. Sandy. Thank you. There's so many achievements. They're so big, we had to make the print really small. Uh, so uh, this is to give, uh, many of you have seen this presentation before, but for those of you who haven't, this is just to give you a sense of how the dollars in the capital plan have worked uh, in the uh, most recent past and uh, what's going on with them right now. Uh, so every year there are um, a series of roadways and sidewalks um, that uh, I won't go through all the names of them, but I will say that if you're interested in knowing on the DPW page uh, on the town's website, there is a list of all of the, those uh, roadway projects and a, a map that shows where those are done. Um, same thing with some of the water and sewer improvements. Most recently, some of the things that we've accomplished is putting the signals up in uh, the new traffic signals up in the center of town, renovating and reopening the Gibbs schools, buying a new ambulance and pumper. We're pretty much all the way through the VoIP phone system, which is a voiceover internet protocol system. So it's a modernization of a phone system that if you, if you saw the old one, it was in the basement of the high school, held, held together with chicken wire and bubble gum, um, and it was literally a 30-year-old, essentially, computer. Um, we are now, uh, we have all of the buildings in town up on the VoIP system except the fire department and they're right now having to change over some of the wiring in the library to get that done. But everything else is now on the VoIP system. Um, and we uh, installed a new filtration plant at the reservoir. In progress now again are various water and sewer roadway improvements. Again, they're up on the website. Um, I'll just quickly mention, because you're going to hear more detail, work that's going on now at the Central School, uh, which some people might refer to as the Senior Center, but is now officially called the Community Center. At the High School, again, you'll hear a little bit more about that and about the DPW building. There are people who will talk a little more detail. Um, we are about to start renovations at the Parmenter School which had the front part of that school, the older part had been rented out for the um, International School of Boston. And those tenants have left. That building is being renovated. A new elevator is being installed to make it ADA accessible um, so that the Mononymy Preschool can move in there, get the little kids out of the high school all during the construction project of the high school, um, and have that in place so those kids can be in there uh, starting in September. Uh, the, uh, they say that you're going to probably see construction fencing going up there uh, in the next week or two uh, to get that going. Uh, the Mystic Street Bridge uh, is on a little bit on hold. We've done our part of it, but there are several utilities that run across that bridge, and we're waiting for um, <coughs> various utility companies to move their pipes or lines or, or wires. So, uh, in various instances so that then we can move forward. That's being funded by uh, a grant. We are well on our way toward um, almost all of the major, initial major <coughs> upgrades to the MUNA system that uh, was funded by town meeting starting about five years ago. Um, the one major thing that has yet to be done is to um, integrate our water and sewer billing system into uh, the MUNA system. Um, that is a, uh, at this point, about a year long project going forward. Um, we've started to do a lot of the initial work, but it's a, it's a huge amount of data conversion from another 30 year old computer. 
uh, I think it was, uh, I forget how old it is, but it's one of those things that if it breaks, you'll never get it running again. Um, but so I think that's been a huge success. It's been, a, the, the, the town should pat itself on the back for investing in a good IT infrastructure that allows the treasurer and the comptroller and all the departments to be able to do their jobs in a modern, efficient way. Um, the police radio system is um, it, it's, uh, being installed. It, uh, that should be up in uh, parts of it running in uh, the next month or so. Um, so it's going to be a new, modernized radio system for police officers. So when they, right now, sometimes when they are in buildings, they cannot get a signal, which is a bad thing. If, because if you're in a building, it's probably for a bad reason. And so you want to make sure that radio signal gets to you. This will be an improvement by putting new um, repeaters and so forth up at Turkey Hill and at the police station, one other place, um, so that we have uh, total coverage. Uh, the Lake Street signals, this is along uh, the bike path there um, to uh, modernize that. Um, and Whittemore Robbins, um, we are uh, moving forward in the architectural phase, uh, the design phase of renovating those three buildings back there through money that has uh, been allocated by town meeting in the past uh, year. And um, we expect that it, that stuff will be out to bid and that work will get done this summer. So that's just a very quick, knowing that there's a long presentation, <coughs> a very quick summary of, of where we are right now. Any questions? Okay. All right, now that we've talked about things, we get to talk about really fun stuff like money <laughs> and spreadsheets. <laughs> this is my favorite part. Um, I, recently, I just have to say, in all full disclosure, I recently did a um, presentation at the Mass Municipal Association, and I told everybody that I, how much I love spreadsheets and how much I love geeking out on spreadsheets. And I just got the feedback back from the conference, and the first piece of feedback was how much they enjoyed that I said that I geeked out on for spreadsheets. <laughs> so I, I hope to share that enthusiasm with all of you. Uh, as Timur said, we have um, this rule of 5% of the budget going to capital. But um, some of that 5%, uh, some of the total budget, which you will see um, in the proposed operating budget for FY21 and in these years going forward, it's all uh, part of the numbers that you see in um, the five-year plan, which is in the manager's budget book, and which will be part of the uh, finance committee report when you come out, um, some of that money isn't really money that can be spent on capital because it is income that comes into the town but is really reserved for other purposes. So we then, what we do is we take the total town budget and we take out the things that really cannot be spent on capital. And the first one of those is an adjustment for water sewer, which means as many of you know, we subsidize our water and sewer rates with tax dollars. It's sometimes referred to as the MWRA debt shift. Arlington is maybe the only town still in the state that does this. It was a good idea years ago when it first went into effect because it meant that people could essentially write off some of their water and sewer bills on their tax bills because you can deduct a tax, but you cannot deduct a fee. Now that uh, the changes in federal tax law have changed those deduction amounts and set a $10,000 cap on that, that that's going to go away. Uh, but we still have it in place. And because all of that $5.5 million is going from tax dollars to subsidize the water and sewer, you can't take 5% of that and put it toward capital. Similarly, when we have exempt debt service, in other words, we've gone to the voters and asked them uh, to raise their taxes for special capital projects, whether it's the Minuteman High School or, the, or um, the, the, the Arlington High School or all of the elementary schools that were renovated through uh, debt exclusion overrides over the years. That is, can you be used and only used for that purpose? You can't take 5% of that. And then we take money from um, the enterprise funds and a couple of other sources 
it's what we call an offset to the town budget. We take what the total town budget is and we charge the uh, enterprise funds a certain percentage of the time that people like me who are paid by the general fund uh, spend to work on things like the enterprise fund work. And so that's a direct payment from the enterprise funds, a, a, a source. And again, that has nothing to do with capital. So you reduce all of that and then you get to this number here, which is the base that we use for the 5% rule. Um, this is, um, I'll just say, this is somewhat um, dynamic. <laughs> Uh, although during the year these numbers change and projections change, but at one point we kind of take a snapshot and say, here we are, Capital Planning Committee, here we are, Finance Committee, this is the number we're going to work with, and this is what we're going to do our 5% off of. Now even more and even smaller numbers. <laughs> uh, what this is showing is how we come into compliance with that 5% rule. And what we essentially say is we're spending a lot of money, prior non-exempt debt service, in other words, debt service that is not supported by an override, just regular old debt service paid for by the general fund. We add to that the cash that we're spending in this capital plan, and then an estimate of what new debt service we're going to issue, uh, non-exempt debt service, as bonds, and new debt service that is going to um, be issued through a ban, a temporary one-year uh, note that we sometimes <coughs> will issue as a transitional funding source until we send, sell permanent bonds. All of which is to say, all of that adds up to about $10.9 million here. Uh, pretty much across the board, it's in that range. So that's everything we are spending. But not all of it comes from the general fund. So there are lots of other sources here that we use to deduct from the total to get a subtotal of what the actual amount being spent out of the general fund and what your 5% calculation is based on. So um, I'll just spend a little bit of time talking about this because I know some of you have not heard this before. But again, uh, when we have debt up here for things, it's going to include regular debt for general fund purposes, but also debt, for example, fixing up the rink. So the rink is paying for that. Uh, the same thing for buying an ambulance. We have an ambulance uh, fund, and um, that gets charged uh, for ambulance. Capital carry forwards is the biggest number here, and that what that is is, is 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 really our commitment to recycling. We've taken money from past projects. We've uh, bought what we need from the, those projects. Let's say we had a a truck that was going to cost we thought fifty thousand dollars, and it ended up costing only forty five thousand dollars. We got a better deal on it, say. So we had five thousand dollars left over. Those $5,000 from lots of trucks and projects and borrowings <laughs> and so forth all add up to money that was allocated but not spent. So we are essentially recycling it and reusing it as a source for the coming year. Uh, we have an antenna fund. Uh, we uh, get income from renting out space for cell phone towers. That uh, money is to be used primarily for uh, recreation purposes. And this is linked exactly to some recreation debt uh, and, uh, uh, and projects we have. But the Urban Renewal Fund is the fund uh, that the ARB controls for uh, the Central School and a couple of other buildings. Um, and for projects that are done in their, on their property, they pay part of the freight for, for doing that. Um, recreation Enterprise Fund, again, uh, as you know, we have a, 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 so just like the rig, for recreation capital projects, we hit them up for a certain amount of capital that's coming, uh, specifically debt that uh, relates to them. Um, and then asset sales proceeds, um, under state law, when we uh, sell a, um, a piece of town property, we have to put that money in a certain account that it can be used uh, 
for other, uh, it can't just be used for anything, but it can be used for certain specific uh, capital acquisition, property acquisition purposes. Um, this 750 next year, by the way, is for the sale of uh, the DAV building up on Mass Ave, which is under contract, but we haven't sold it yet. So we keep counting on it, but keep having to put that money back a year, a year, a year. I'm hoping that by next year it will all be done, but that all depends on whether there's going to be a, a new hotel or whatever's going to be built there and the sale's going to go through. Um, when the override went through in 2011, one of the commitments was to spend 5% of it on, or, well, actually, I think it started a certain number, I forget what the exact number was, somebody may remember before me, uh, on road improvements, and that goes up 2.5% <coughs> every year. The same thing for this last override, accessibility improvements, we started at $200,000, that was part of the override campaign, that's going up 5% per year. And then, um, Years ago, we sold a bond and got a very large premium on it back in 2016. And since then, the laws about financing have kind of changed. So we don't do this anymore uh, in this way. But we're basically using the last bit of that premium as a source, and then that's going to go away. Um, oh, and um, this last line is for the Capital projects that we're doing for town-owned properties like the Parmenter School, or like the Dallin, or uh, Ryder Street, or uh, Mount Gaboa, we get a lot more rent out of those than we ever spend on upkeep. In fact, the upkeep of some of those buildings has been minimal to say the least over the years. So what the Capital Planning Committee did say is they're going to uh, attribute some of the rent that comes in from those sources to the capital plan as a source um, to uh, to kind of even out the bargain for the rent you know, we're getting from those buildings and really needing from time to time to uh, invest in them at, at least minimally. Oh, so all those things that deducts from the major expense, you get to then $8.2 million um, of what we're really <coughs> spending, 5% of that uh, 166 from the previous slide is $8,301,000. So <coughs> as things stand right now, we have a surplus in FY21 of $32,000. In other words, we could add $32,000 more dollars in, into the capital plan this year if we found something that was that. Um, generally, what the committee tries to do is hit that 5% over the five years to make sure we're at or under that 5% the first year, and then the other years, it kind of goes up and down. We try to smooth it out as much as possible. But the key numbers are making sure we're at 5% here and 5% here. Any questions? Right. You've got them enthralled. <laughs> no, at least they're all still awake. I think that's a good sign. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> We just wanted to um, know the coordination we have with community preservation and just highlight the RES project um, where we'll be funding from the capital plan $550,000 and um, $350,000 and CPA um, will be funded, is planning to fund three, $587,000 and so the new cost estimates come in for phase two. Okay, so now we're going to go into the section where we will go into each department's requests in some detail, and I'll take it back, and since they are our hosts tonight, we'll start with police. Um, and I'll just note that, as Sandy had mentioned before, um, we have a couple of things on here that actually are not new appropriations for fiscal 21, um, but they are big dollars and works in, pro in, in progress, so we want to recap them. Uh, those would be the first and the third items on, on this list here. So the first one is the replacement of the police and fire radio system <coughs> and the dispatch center was located here in on the first floor. Um, and this was appropriated in uh, <coughs> fiscal 19 and 20 and the total multi-year cost for both departments <coughs> is about $1.4 million and that's in, in progress right now. It's not in 
because it's not an outlay in 21. Um, and I'll just jump ahead a little bit of sequence here. The last thing on here is the final elements of the renovation of this building. There is some money left over from that, and uh, in the process of doing our, our evaluation, our their evaluation, uh, the police and the facilities department uh, came to the conclusion that there should be some repaving of the parking area, um, replacement of the garage door, and then uh, some uh, modifications to include um, uh, an elevator and uh, an accessible entrance. Uh, and so these uh, will tap into the prior allocations. Um, parking is $125,000, garage doors are $45,000, uh, and the accessibility is $23,000. So all, all total coming out of prior, prior funds. Bullet two is the main item for, um, for the police department for, for this year. It's their annual appropriation of $135,000. And that's for vehicle replacement. They have a whole ser series of vehicles. They uh, are looked to replace about three of them per year. It might be um, a, a marked cruiser, it might be an unmarked cruiser, it might be um, uh, a um, motorcycle. And uh, we're looking at, at, at seeing, uh, I think, actually one of each of those in the coming fiscal year. And that is you know, basically a fund that they tap about the same amount every year goes up occasionally because of uh, inflation, but that's what we're talking about for the, um, the coming fiscal year. If no questions about police, we'll turn to fire. I have a quick, quick question. Do you have a question? Um, if they're replacing vehicles on a three-year cycle, does that mean there's no vehicle that's older than three years? Um, probably a couple of exceptions, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> and we have, we, and they, they give us a, um, as part of their request to us, they give us a, a, um, a detailed table of, you know, here are all our vehicles and how old they are and mileage and so forth. So is that common for police departments in the state, in the country? Is that typical? Um, I can't speak to that from my own personal knowledge. Um, I can say that we've been... He can, he it can. seems like Sandy thinks, yes. Go Sandy. <laughs> so the, it, it, we're really talking about cruisers. Yeah. And with cruisers, it's not really miles, it's it's hours that those en the right, engines yeah. are running because uh, they get passed from one person to the next. So they're basically, that engine is running all the time. So it's the, the number of hours that, that really take wear and tear on it. And after a while, it is very common to have a cycle like this. Um, I mean, I, I have to say, Arlington, I've, you've heard me say this before, Arlington a long time ago did a great job of saying 5% of the budget's going to go to capital so that it can, on a regular basis, do things like replace these cars. I have seen other places where they've had to go four years or something like that. That starts to A, cause problems with the cars, and B starts to create morale problems because as things break down, you start to see hear that back from the officers. So I think uh, this three-year cycle has, been, has worked well for the department. When the uh, when the cruiser's just sitting there, the engine's going all the yeah, time to that. keep the computers going and everything else. So uh, what Sandy says, the mileage on the engine is much more than the mileage on the car. John. Um, is there, are there available at all electric vehicles that could be police cars, you know? Because, for example, what Alan was just talking about, sitting there running the engine, yeah. is enormously inefficient. You know, if you had a battery in the car, you charge the battery, you get 90% of the energy out of it for use. Mm -hmm. If it's a gasoline engine, you're maybe getting 5 6% out of it. It's an enormous waste. Especially if it's idling all the time, right? And I'm wondering if uh, you might yeah. think about uh, replacing those with electric vehicles. What I have, what I have seen from them is two things: that they're uh, looking at, at hybrids, not pure electric Speed vehicles up. for the main uh, vehicles, and also looking at um, for things like parking enforcement vehicles, <coughs> looking at, at purely electric vehicles for those. I mean, you know, all the buildings are going in that direction. Right? Yeah, all the new buildings are. There's no energy hookup at all, uh, no fossil energy hookup at all. Everything's electric. So it seems to me you're just beginning to think about automobiles, which are terribly inefficient. Yes. Okay, other questions? Yes. John? Were the town retires an asset, like sells a police car? 
does the money go to the capital budget or does it go to general funds? Uh, I think they trade vehicles where they can. Oh, they trade. Phyllis, could you speak up just a bit, please? Yes. I think they trade vehicles where they can. Uh, that's the case for DPW. That's the case for most departments that have vehicles to try and get a trade. Other questions? Onward. Onward. So fire department. Um, here, the big ticket item in fiscal 21 is a new ambulance, which is at a little over $300,000. Um, this is funded uh, entirely from our ambulance revolving fund. It comes from revenues from for ambulance um, dispatches. In addition, in fiscal 21, we have a, uh, an annual appropriation of $25,000 for firefighter protective gear. Um, this is on a, a multi-year cycle as well. I believe it's a 10-year cycle. Um, and so we're replacing roughly uh, eight uh, units of this per year for, for the firefighters. Um, not shown here, there's another smaller expenditure in, in 21, it's replacement furniture because people live in the fire stations and they wear them out. Uh, so it's $10,000 at the Park Circle Fire Station. Just mentioning here for a couple of the out years, we have a, a, a big ticket coming up in, uh, in next year's uh, plan, which is the, the new pumper at over $600,000. And then uh, the Jaws of Life equipment that we have, uh, it's coming to the end of its uh, estimated 10-year lifespan, uh, <laughs> and uh, that would require a $50,000 replacement in fiscal 23. Yes? Marie? So I have a question about um, for the coronavirus threat, or whatever you want to call it, how will we prepare for that in terms of money? If you need to buy equip special equipment for that or anything, I don't know all the details, but just putting it out there. How how is the town prepared for that, and where are the funds? Where will the funds come from? Charlie, <coughs> ah, thank you. it's called the uh, reserve fund, and it's under the control of finance. You'll get a chance to vote on that oh, later. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to add, Sandy? Any special things that are being done with the virus? Uh, there, I, I don't think there's been any particular actions. I think we are monitoring it. We do have an emergency response uh, <coughs> committee that is uh, chaired by the, by the fire chief uh, to look at disasters and other emergency response. It includes representatives from police, town manager's office, uh, IT, other offices, and including, on a, depending on what the issue is, that the health department, which would be the most appropriate for this. Um, but we have not in any of the meetings I've been in so far, had a call from any of them the, the need to buy you know, masks or ventilators or anything like that. Uh, I remember years ago when SARS was around, there were a lot of conversations about that. Fortunately, that didn't ever develop that way. But So I'd say we're keeping an eye on it, but we have not been told at this point that we need to buy anything. Okay, Dean? So on that, I guess I'll, on the combined public safety request, right, so police and fire, um, stipulating up front that I know the patrolmen have at times requested that vests be swapped out annually, and they're not, that's fine. Um, when the subcommittee met with the chiefs of police in fire, did they feel that their um, capital needs were being met through the budget, or is there, or do they have some kind of cons any concerns that there's something that they need to keep people safe that is not being met in the budget. Okay, so I'm on, on this committee and I <coughs> heard no concerns from either uh, the then acting chief, the new, the new police chief, or the or, or the current fire chief that what they were asking for was not being met by the, by this budget. Okay, and just for the committee's own understanding, I've asked that question for like 15 years. So there's no actual like rationale behind it besides I just keep asking. Okay, any questions on any of the public safety that we've just gone through? All right, I'll turn it back to Sandy now to talk about our town owned rental property. <coughs> okay. um, I'm going to talk about this, but at first, I want to give all the credit for this to Julie, who did the work to 
put all this information together, and then I just get to stand up here. But it's only fair to say that she really did the work. So uh, I want to. Uh, so there are two classes of buildings that we um, we own. One are the buildings that are under the Urban Renewal Fund. Um, they are three buildings: the Central School. Um, they that are leased out, the, um, the upper stories are leased out to various tenants, including um, Arlington Center for the Arts, Sorry, the Mystic Watershed Park Association, um, is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, weatherization program, uh, the um, <coughs> retirement office, and so forth. Um, then um, there's 23 Maple Street, which is the residential house right next door. Um, it is currently uh, currently houses a residential treatment facility for uh, for youth. Um, their lease expires uh, at the end of this fiscal year, June 30th, and uh, it is not going to be renewed. We are uh, investigating now what other uses might be um, made of that building, including perhaps um, putting certain municipal <coughs> departments, maybe including IT, in there because IT has to move out of um, the high school because they're, they're tearing down the building that, in which they live. Um, and the new space at the DPW isn't going to be ready yet. Um, so one of the things we might think about is maybe putting them in there for a year or two. Um, so that's under um, investigation. And then Jefferson uh, uh, Cutter House, uh, which is um, down at the center of town. Um, they, over the years, the Urban Renewal Fund um, collected a lot more rent, uh, particularly out of um, the Central School than it does now. Um, and so we are kind of always watching what the balance is. They have about $200,000 left in their fund. Um, that is of June, as of June 30th or July 1st, 2019. I think that was when we did it. Um, and we're taking, I think, 40,000 out of it in this capital plan. So one of these days, we're gonna, there's gonna be sort of a day of reckoning as to how sustainable that fund is. But for the time being, there's enough that we can keep going over, at least over the span of this capital plan. The other buildings that we own are uh, the Parmenter School, which I talked about, um, which has a, had two tenants, now is gonna continue with one tenant leasing in the back there, at least goes through 2024, FY 2024. Um, the Dallin Library, uh, which is where ACMI has its studios, um, they, we, we do not have a lease with them, but they are continuing to pay rent uh, under the, ter the terms of the prior lease, so the term is just gonna continue in place. Uh, Ryder Street uh, is, uh, <laughs> it's a unique building. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's kind of this rundown place uh, kind of behind uh, my rack. Um, we are going to make, we have a tenant in there, uh, a, a landscaping business. Um, their lease expires in June. Um, they will then move out. <coughs> I believe that the owners may be kind of wrapping up their landscaping business. Um, and then we will make use of that space for um, putting certainly DPW vehicles and maybe one of the divisions, maybe the uh, natural resources division into that site starting um, this summer because they have to clear out uh, the current DPW location. Um, we've also talked about with the school department eventually maybe uh, siting th their school buses there because they used to be sited at the DPW and so there's a possibility of maybe moving there, them there over the long run. And then Mount Gilboa um, is uh, up in uh, Western Arlington uh, in the park up there. Um, it's a great place to, to go on Halloween because it looks like the monsters live there <laughs> um, up this long winding driveway. Um, we do have a residential tenant in there who pays rent um, that um, the lease expired in 2018, but it has two one-year options, which the tenant has uh, and we have agreed to um, to take advantage of. Um, so those are all the buildings that we own and from which we derive a certain amount of rent. And then this next sheet just shows 
kind of a profit loss statement uh, for each of these. Dean? Now, can I ask a question? Yeah, Dean. So, regarding Rider Street, so you're saying in the short term, you're going to put DPW equipment and natural resource equipment. And maybe even staff there, too. And then at the lot? We're talking about that with landscaping? And then long term, they're going to have it. It, what's the long-term use? Yet to be determined. I just met, I know the school department is interested in maybe parking its school buses there overnight because they like to have a secure place for their school buses. So just for the for the parking lot itself, the building, um, that is all part of more discussions about what to do with it. But that's probably two or three years away <coughs> once okay. the DPW project is finished and and they can move back over to Grove Street. Okay, so as part of the DPW and school department project, the town made a decision to take the playing field, the referred to the peers practice, away. Because they said, well, we need it for DPW. Yeah. So the user groups had a concern, and the town manager had a memo he issued on December 4th, 2018, where he talked about alternatives. And one of his alternatives was under 4B, Exploring potential use of the town-owned parcel on Ryder Street, currently rented to La Licata Landscaping, is a soccer slash lacrosse field. And so, if I'm hearing this, this is different. So the town manager has made a decision. He wrote that then, but now he's made a decision that he wants to go in a different direction with that parcel. I think for the in the short run, yes, we need that space for DPW to get out of. Grove Street during the construction project. Sure, but in the long term? In the long term, I don't. Th th in the long term, there's no decision has been made about what to do with that property. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Christine? The, the second one year ex option at Mel Gilboa is expiring this year? I believe so. I, I, and I, I think we'd have to then negotiate a new lease or put it out. Yes. And is that the plan to to negotiate a new lease or put it out <coughs> to a bid again? Yes, because I think we're going to have to at, at some point. You can't just, it's, it's a public property, so we have to go through a process. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Sandy? So, um, this is more informational. I don't want to go through all, all the, the numbers here, but Basically, what it's there's a report that is issued every year to the Capital Planning Committee, kind of looking at how these buildings are. These buildings make it a profit. Are we losing money on them, and so forth? Uh, and so we analyze the income that comes in from these places, um, including whatever carrying costs there are for debt for uh, that we've issued to do work on these places. Which for most, most of them is fairly minimal. And then we, so we do one analysis with including the debt and one without. And overall, what you see is that we make substantial profits uh, in the, including the debt. Uh, in FY19, we were running a profit of about $361,000. Without the debt, it was about $405,000. Uh, on that's the cumulative for all of these. The, the notable exception is um, the Urban Renewal Fund, where um, the last few years we've basically been drawing down the balance in that Urban Renewal Fund because um, we're spending more money on uh, that than, uh, or the Urban Renewal Fund is spending more of its own funds on investing in capital than it's taking in, in, in rent. Um, so that's why I think in the long run it's something that we're going to have to come to grips with. Okay, any question, John? Uh, are we maintaining these properties appropriately, maybe with the except, possible exception of the Rider Street property that you talked about, which is kind of raggy, but the other places? Um, so Mount Gilboa, we just had to replace the roof because really nothing had been done there for years, and the tenant was complaining about water getting in there. That, I think, was the first time in a long, long time that we've done much. That building at some point probably is going to need repainting and things like that. Um, Harmenter, uh, we've kept up with, I think, fairly well. There's been a line in the operating budget for years uh, to, to do repairs there. 
Um, that money has now been moved into the facilities department facilities, so it's all part of that budget. And we're doing a major renovate. Well, the the, um, the elevator is a major expense. It's not going to do much for the rest of the building. There are still things that we're going to we're looking at in the future years with that with the heating system and so forth. It's probably going to need more work. Uh, and then Dallin, I know from time to time we have put money in there to make repairs to the heating system, to fix uh, the accessible walk entrance where there there were some issues of water getting in from the parking lot and so forth. So in general, I think the building is, is running along. It's an old library. It's a pretty sturdy building. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Early over to you. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> so, uh, what you see up there is a picture of the uh, original Central School. I just want you to note that uh, even though uh, Sandy referred to the building uh, previously as the Central School, despite renaming it the Community Center, um, I stretched the uh, across the chasm here and I called the Central School and the Community Center on the same slide. Um, but this uh, building was. Uh, originally built in 1894. It served a number of purposes for the town over the years. You can see that um, uh, outlined in that slide. Um, and uh, over the last couple of years, town meeting has allocated through a series of appropriations approximately eight and a quarter million dollars for the uh, renovation of the bottom two floors of the, the building. Uh, the upper floor where the Arlington Center for the Arts is located was renovated at their expense about three years ago, I think. The next slide is uh, just the status of where that is. And the, the design <laughs> is complete. There's, uh, there's a project manager, uh, owner's project manager. The, the permanent town building committee is involved in it, in, in managing the construction. Uh, it is behind schedule. It was supposed to more or less start in January. It's now uh, planned to begin in March. and. Um, they have created a cash flow plan, which has been communicated to the treasurer to uh, organize the bonding and the financing. And uh, very importantly, uh, the uh, planning department has come up with a logistics plan to continue to provide services to the various users of the building, uh, even though they'll, uh, you know, the, those spaces will not be available. Uh, on the next slide uh, is a little summary of these uh, uh, various services. Uh, with respect to the Seniors Association, the Council on Aging, the Retirement Board. The Retirement Board right now is, uh, is concerned about uh, the schedule because there's a gap in, in uh, where they can be uh, located. They're in the high school right now. I'm sorry, they're in the, uh, on the second floor of the, this building. If they have to move out, um, they will have a hard time uh, providing services to their 600 uh, uh, constituents in the uh, contributory retirement system. Um, and I guess the rest of the, the, uh, the details are there on the slide. Notice that the, starting uh, in March, there'll be no regular meetings in the senior <coughs> main room, the arts and crafts room, or the mural room because of the planned construction. Uh, on the next slide is a simple uh, timeline. And you can see on the left-hand side uh, with those two little flags, the uh, start of construction uh, starts around uh, May 4th. And then uh, it's anticipated to be complete uh, in uh, 2021. And then all the people will be moving back by about June of 2021. And the next slide uh, just outlines a cash flow plan uh, that the money has, uh, you know, some of the money for planning and, and the uh, hiring of the, the OPM, et cetera, has already been committed and spent. And uh, the, you can see the balance of it is going to ramp up during this year and uh, be completed by uh, the late spring of uh, 2021. I think that's what I have to say. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Okay. All right. Where you? So I'm going to talk uh, about recreation and the rink, and then a little bit about playgrounds. Um, so the uh, on the recreation department. Um, the two main ongoing things that the capital plan is paying for are um, ADA study implementation program. So the, the, several years ago, the 
Recreation Department completed a study of ADA upgrades that would be necessary at uh, various parks and playgrounds, and so they're working their way through at about $50,000 a year. Kind of goes up and down, but the funding is $50,000 a year in terms of what we allocate um, to implement those improvements, so walkways, playground upgrades, various things, like all for accessibility. Um, and then $10,000 a year they spend roughly on uh, just studying future playground update grades, and I'll talk in a minute, like I said, about sort of what that leads to in terms of actual projects. Um, so those are just, you know, those continue all through a year, all five years, sorry, of the capital plan. Uh, and then the Ed Burns Arena, uh, two upcoming sort of more significant improvements there, which would be paid for through the, um, the, the um, fund uh, for the arena. Um, they want to upgrade the um, accessibility of the uh, bleacher area in the rink with a bleacher lift, which will allow people to get to different levels for $150,000 in this coming fiscal year. And then they anticipate needing to do repairs on the barrel roof, so the major, the main roof over the, the ice surface itself, um, and that's about $200,000. We're programming in fiscal year 22. That may move around a little bit in the future, but that's a sort of good placeholder uh, for the time being. Um, so those are the sort of um, general pieces of the recreation and the rink budget, capital budget. So I, I may be, see if there are any questions on that before I move on to playgrounds. Peter? Uh -huh. Could, could you review the situation with the state on the on the uh, on the rink? Um, so we didn't get into a ton of detail on that with the um, in the subcommittee when we met with um, the head of the recreation department. But I, I know that that's all, I guess all I can say, sort of semi knowledgeably, is that that is an upcoming issue in terms of um, you know the, the the town's lease or, or agreement to operate. The rink, um, it's not something that they anticipated any specific capital needs immediately, other than just the kind of upkeep that I mentioned. Um, it didn't sound like there was any, any I'm not aware of, and uh, maybe if you have anything to add on this, of any plans to sort of change the basic um, you know, arrangement with the state, unless the state kind of forces the issue through some action on their part, you know, if they were to decide they wanted to divest themselves of that asset. Uh, Sandy, is there anything else you would add? On that. Sort of Mary Margaret. Right. And I was going to say, when we get back to that, I was going to read what Sandy wrote, but what the lease agreement was and the amount and how we capped the fees and all of that. When we get to the rink again, oh, be, we know the answer. Well, you know, I mean, okay. build the money. <laughs> okay. I had a couple comments have come up during the course of our. Uh, meetings about the state of the locker rooms okay. uh, that uh, uh, they leave something to be desired is any work of the locker rooms been contemplated in any of this that has not come up during our discussions in subcommittee so we can certainly try to you know find out more about that for when we go through the process for okay but nothing's been done so nothing it hasn't been mentioned in any of the conversations it's something that maybe it's I don't know if it's doesn't rise to the level of them considering a capital upgrade or if they just haven't gotten to that yet. So, okay. All right, on, on playgrounds, um, so the first slide uh, of two on this just kind of lays out um, the uh, where we are with uh, planned expenditures, and this is both from, CP, from the capital plan but also anticipated from CPA and mostly as the, the um, footnote at the bottom mentions coming from, expected to be coming from CPA. Um, as I think Angela mentioned, um, you know, the, the re reservoir uh, improvements phase two, the capital plan's funding $350,000, and CPA has agreed to fund $587,000, which has actually increased as, the, as time went by uh, in FY21. So that's our kind of major playground upgrade <coughs> that's, that's taking place this coming fiscal year. And then the chart below kind of lays out the expected. Um, Playground improvements over the next over the the, the four out years of the plan, um, with um, you know kind of one major playground at four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars a year, and as I'll get to in a minute, that that number is something we need to really be thinking about, uh, along with some more significant upgrades um, at Hertz Field and at Poets Corner. Uh, the only element that the capital plan is currently um, anticipated to pay for under the current assumptions 
is this off-leash dog area at Hills Hill, which is adjacent to the uh, arena. Um, so I guess the, the, real, the real discussion um, is about um, kind of where we go next with this, because um, I think as, as this slide sort of lays out and based on our discussions with the recreation department, but also based on some other things that are happening, uh, particularly with some, as you see at the bottom, with some cost estimates for um, uh, playgrounds on school property. Um, we answer, you know, the, the use of these facilities is increasing. The, I think the expectations from residents are increasing, um, but the facilities are aging and they require not just upgrades to sort of where they are now, but actual additional improvements to keep um, pace with code changes, the types of materials that are used to keep kids safe, um, and just the general fact that, you know, construction costs, as, as we've seen certainly, and I assume you've all seen as well, uh, are you know going up at a higher rate than I think we, we would have expected, or at least than, than the, the the normal level of inflation, or certainly the normal two and a half percent increase. Um, and so, as you can see, like I said at the bottom, there's um, you know the and I think there there are ways to bring these down. And I think you know Michael's working on that as well. Um, but you know the two bids for school playgrounds at the Hardy School and the Pierce School both came in significantly over the budget, uh, and were were anticipating funding those through the capital plan at this point but if you think about that those numbers in the context of the previous slide and like I said the four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars we've been carrying as a kind of baseline cost estimate um, they certainly don't jive with each other and so I think there's a, a, a larger discussion um, that you know the capital planning committee needs to have and, and perhaps this group and others need to have about how do we actually meet resident expectations how do we continue to upgrade our playgrounds or potentially can we can we continue to do one playground a year which has been the sort of what's been happening recently or does that schedule need to be extended out but then we may get into a situation where we're not able to actually keep up with the state of good repair because by the time we get to the a playground it's going to be falling apart at, at, a, at a longer time frame so i don't obviously have the answer to that question but i think we felt as a committee that it was important to highlight that um, to, to others to sort of say this is a this is a discussion that's coming and like I said I think our resident expectations are are ever increasing and so just saying well we're not going to be able to fix as many playgrounds may not sort of cut it so um, I guess I'll just sort of leave it there as an open question for either for discussion either now or at, a, at some other point. So. Any questions? I know where you could find an extra Thirty-two thousand dollars. If we're only. I'm sorry. This year, maybe not next year. Yeah, no. On the recreation, the town, I think, is maybe even a year ago was in discussion with a college and maybe a private school about a larger scale renovation at Poets. Are those discussions ongoing, or have they sort of like cooled off, for lack of a better way to put it? Um, that certainly did not come up in our discussions this year, um, and so I, I, I can't I can't say whether there is still any ongoing discussions. But certainly, you know, the request was what you see on the, the table on slide 23 um, didn't indicate that there was any external funding or you know participation that was expected at this point. Um, so it sounds like. If they haven't gone away completely, they certainly aren't aren't that active. As far as we were told, I think there was initially a lot of discussion with Leslie University, mm -hmm. and um, I think as they started to look at their numbers, they pulled back some. I think we're still interested in doing something in poets, but the initial enthusiasm over that plan led to you know, some pull feet, and we're still looking at ways to. I think we still are interested in doing something there. We just don't have. A viable plan at this moment. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. All right. Moving along, we'll cover libraries. The administration subcommittee covers that portion of our budget, and that's Edith Cody. Okay. Here we go. So I'll be covering the library projects. Uh, as you know, last year this was a hot topic, and it remains a hot topic for this year um, in light of the master plan and the mixed use of the building. The slide that you see there um, shows the popularity of the Arlington libraries 
and also the fact that the internet with its free information did not put the libraries out of business. The only thing that the internet did is just change the way that uh, the Arlington libraries do business. Specifically, um, we have around um, 100 machines or pieces of equipment such as laptops, um, Chromebooks, printers, scanning devices that are free for the patrons use. Also, I have learned today an interesting fact. Um, specifically, um, the library offers some non-traditional tools to support the complex interests and hobbies of the um, patrons of the Arlingtonians. Uh, these are sewing machines, uh, kitchen gadgets, and other tools that people are interested in. Um, Andrea Nikolai provided statistics uh, to prove the high demand um, of the, um, for the um, library uh, services. Um, in 2019, uh, we had over 1,000 visitors per day, and the reports showed that Arlington libraries were had the highest, sixth highest circulation among the 43 libraries in the Miniman Library Network. We were the ninth highest site statewide and the fifth highest statewide in children program att attendance after Boston, Cambridge, Springfield, and Newton. We've also seen an increase in the um, teen room use and that was increased um, uh, the library staff reported that they found more than 50 teams in a space that was designed just for the 30 for 30 teams. If you remember last year we cited the library staff who said that uh, they find teams in every nook and cranny including under the staircase. It's still the case the, the libraries are overcrowded and they've also um, they've also um, um, recorded lar an, a large influx of Gibbs students um, at the Fox Library. We've also learned recently that the, um, from the master plan that the family with children in Arlington increased to 48% in the past 15 years. Um, the public meeting rooms have been uh, very popular also and they increased 80% over the past decade. Um, all these boards and committees and group, volunteer groups and commissions are enjoying the, the uh, free space and they're competing for the spaces. This is a wordy slide, but I'm just gonna highlight the main points. The library is only requesting $52,000 to buy equipment for the, um, for the library to be in compliance with the MLN um, technology standards. This includes laptops, printers, software packages, uh, security and antivirus software. Um, as you know, uh, our libraries are part of the Miniman li uh, uh, Library Network, which includes 43 um, members, 43 communities. <coughs> and the main benefits of being a member are the access to the ML and Riches collection. We also derive value from having access to a wider world of resources and the reports and statistics um, that the network provides custom reports to evaluate the library services. And the last slides um, provide an update of the large um, building constructions. The first one is the Robbins library which this is going to this year uh, we plan on renovating it and putting an addition we have updated costs the new cost of the robins is 13.15 million dollars the design was pushed to fiscal year 23 and the cost the new cost is 1.15 million dollars and the new construction cost is scheduled for fiscal 25 <coughs> and it is anticipated to be $12 million. This includes the OBM of 500, the fit out 1.5, and an estimated 100,000, the cost of moving. We do not have updates on the Fox Library as there's still a lot of questions that need to be answered. Uh, we, s we kept the fiscal year $19, the, co the total estimated cost of the project is $7.82 million. 
uh, we pushed the construction beyond fiscal 25, but the design work is scheduled for fiscal year 24 in the amount of 680,000. Um, like I said, we still have questions that need to be answered, uh, which is, can we explore the mixed use and the related funding models and how could the library maximize the site's potential? Next. Oh, next. Yep. Timur, Timur. Yes. Sorry. Yes. This is just a summary of the potential investments. We went over the numbers, <coughs> um, but it's worth mentioning that we do have additional funding sources in addition to the capital plan funds. We have, um, as you know, a lot of groups and commissions and a lot of volunteers dedicated to raise money to continue the operations and improve the operations at the library. Uh, we have the Friends of Fox, Friends of um, Robbins, the Little Fox Shop, and we also gonna be eligible for the MBLC grant reimbursement. We have two libraries to build, but only one is gonna be eligible for the grant. Although, these two projects are major and it seems like we'll be spending a lot of money, we also have to keep in mind that it's really not excessive compared to other municipalities. Um, we looked at Medford, who spent uh, $34 million in Medford Public li Libraries and they had a reimbursement of 34000 from MBLC. And Woburn spent $31 million in their libraries and they got 31 percent uh, percent uh, reimbursement from the grant. You just said three four thousand. Thirty four million. Per, oh, okay. thirty four million was what they spent, but then you said they reimbursed thirty four percent. Did I say that? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> thirty four million and thirty four percent. Okay. And Worry about Woburn our controller spent. that gets these things mixed up. Who blows that some points? Rounding error. And Woburn spent thirty one point five million dollars with thirty one percent reimbursement. We're not going to use the phrase close enough for government work in this presentation. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when do you anticipate that you'd actually be putting a bond authorization in front of us. Fiscal, you know, two years from now? On Fox? Well, on the Robbins, the first big one. I, so it looks like I two years from now? Right? Yeah. No, so I, I, 20, uh, 23. The design is scheduled wasn't, the, wasn't the notion that we would, we, we, we would ban that and then bond the full amount come 25? Yes. So I think. Yeah moved it out because we're not, we don't have enough detail yet. Okay. Now I just wondered when uh, this committee in town meeting will be actually looking at a bond authorization for this project. Will it be next year, will it be the year after? Uh, I think at this point we don't have an answer for you. It, it, it could be next year, but we have more work to do. Any other questions? Christine? Will we need to move books out of either or both of these libraries? And if so, where are we putting them? During the construction library, uh, Robbins will stay open and there will be minimal time when, downtime, when the, the library will not be open for the visitors, for the residents. Fox Library, we don't have any plans. We don't know. We don't have concrete plans in place. Do you know whether you'll need to, to move books out of either of those buildings during the construction? We were also um, we were thinking about the possibility of getting some modulars to move some of the equipment and books into the modulars. But again, like I said, we don't have concrete plans in place. We've allocated roughly $100,000 for the change. The temporary change. Okay. Arif? So I have, a, I have a question, and I'm just going to put it out there. I'm not sure there's an answer to it. So, just something for, for my, my thinking, kind of back in the committee and thinking about this. Is there a framework to think about return on this investment? 
I mean, one of the things, the slide you started with was, you know, the amount of people attending, coming to the library, the usage numbers, et cetera. So being sort of a, a, a numbers geek as well, I'm just starting to think, how do you guys think about it? Is there a framework around that? And, and you mentioned some other towns and the number of, the amount of capital they've spent and so forth. So have they calculated it? Is there a benchmark? Uh, I don't know about other towns, but we, uh, I believe we measure our return on investment based on people's satisfaction and the services that we can provide to the residents of Arlington, because that's why you pay quite taxes <laughs> to have great services. So I guess we measure it in terms of services and, and satisfaction. No, it's hard to measure it in dollars. Alan? Alan? Well, this is more of a, a comment about the usage of the library that isn't really uh, spelled out here. And I just learned about recently speaking with some people who live in Cusack Towers. In the summer, it gets really hot and there's really no air conditioning. So they use the library as a cooling center. <coughs> Apparently, a lot of people in town without air conditioning flock to the library for cooling. So, so I'm hoping during the renovations, there's there's space for people to just hang out during the hot days as they get increasingly hot. And maybe the new community center will also, the plans I've seen for the community center also may have more casual gathering places, you know, comfortable with, you know, sofas and tables and things that could also be used for cooling centers. But I think that, that to some people, it's a very important role, which isn't I, really mentioned. So. I guess this will be addressed, will all be addressed in the feasibility study. Yeah. So I was hoping that that function is considered because I know it's important to be, it's not just reading books, it's just a comfortable place if you're living in a place that has no air conditioning. Okay, any other questions or comments? Right. I bet Sandy didn't tell you when he was interviewing for this job that part of it is talk, talking about libraries. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. All right, passing it over to Chris to talk about the DPW. So uh, we approved the DPW in town meeting in 2019, so we're not uh, adding anything to that, but this is just an update on where the project stands. Um, we hired a construction manager at risk in January, um, and so things should be going out to bid later this year. Uh, right now, we're still kind of in the early stages of figuring out you know, what's, the, what's the cash flow gonna look like and all that, so that we don't have that kind of detail for you yet about this project. Uh, go to the next slide, we do have uh, what we presented at town meeting and, and before this committee last time around about how we expect that it will be financed. Uh, it's about 32.2 million in total, uh, split between the capital plan and the water sewer fund. Uh, the exact split will probably vary a little bit as they, they uh, finalize the plans and figure out you know, how much of this building is really being used by the water sewer function. Uh, that's the, the reason that it, the funding is split up this way. Um, the capital plan component is scheduled as a 30-year bond, and uh, should the and at, and at least planned at this point that it would be level payment, um, which means that that bond's going to be sticking around with us, costing the same amount for 30 years. Um, and that that particular choice to put this in the capital plan and fund it this way means that uh, it you know it, it adds to our. Uh, it reduces our flexibility in the future, and that's something that, that you know we're already starting to see uh, the kinds of impact that it has on us as we try to fit in other major projects. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, another thing that we wanted to talk about with respect to public works or a Department of Public Works is roads. Um, this is a map uh, from the 2019 Road Quality Survey. Um, Essentially, the blue and the green roads are in, in very good condition. Yellow is kind of what they call fair, uh, and that's about the average for the town. Uh, and then the yellow and orange roads are the roads that are in, in uh, rough shape. And if you're trying to find your, your, your house on here, just yeah. note that east is up on this <laughs> yeah. map, so it's a little confusing. A little a bit <laughs> awkward, yeah. I tried <laughs> rotating it the other way, that caused me other problems. Anyway, um, so that survey is used, it, it surveys all of the roads in town and it's used to prioritize how the maintenance uh, is done. Go to the next slide. Uh, there are about 96 and a half miles of roads that the town is in charge of maintaining. Um, the average condition is a 79 uh, on the scale that these folks use, which they call fair. Um, but one of the things that's awkward is we've been spending, roughly speaking, uh, about a million and a half dollars a year on road maintenance. Um, they anticipate uh, with their model, which includes 
you know, the rate at which roads are decaying, as well as co increase in costs, that if we continue to do that, we will see a steady deterioration in our road quality. Um, and that if we want to maintain uh, the level we're at today, that's going to cost something more like $2 million a year. Um, we are not able within the 5% limit at this point with all the other things that, that are in the plan able to reach that level. So the current plan that we're putting before you tonight uh, increases the funding to an average of $1.7 million per year. A little bit short of what is required according to the, the uh, consultants to maintain our current quality. Yeah? Why not just recommend increasing it to $2 million? Well, then we'd have to cut something else. <laughs> so we, we tried to find a way to fit it all in, and uh, that was the choice we came up with. It gets um, us closer, and maybe eventually we could get right. closer. And you know, that, that's the hope, is that over time we can figure out a way to get closer to that, too. And of course, that $2 million will escalate over time as well as, as building right. costs increase. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Right now, the schools. Um, so as Sandy mentioned earlier, the high school project is funded by exempt debt, um, which means it's not in, in the capital plan, but it's an important project, so we wanted to include it here. Um, and you probably know there was, there's a specific budget for this because it was in the debt exclusion vote, and the uh, estimates had come in, the design higher than that. So the building committee was able to um, close that gap, and they did it without jeopardizing any of the educational needs. And then we just wanted to include here, this is the reminder for the timeline, um, and that it is expected, the first phase is expected to start um, this month in March. And so, um, for the non-exempt uh, capital plan items, there was about 24 requests, and this, this slide is just going to summarize some of the more notable items that are, were substantial, the investments for the, for the schools. Um, the first one was we established a, a vehicle replacement plan for both the student transportation and um, facility vehicles. Um, so it'll be a 10-year plan, replacing the oldest vehicles first um, and on, on a rotating basis. Uh, this year, we'll replace two uh, student vehicles and one facilities, facilities vehicle um, with the intentions of changing some of the facilities vehicles to uh, vehicles that can handle snow removal and moving around snow so that we don't have to do contracting that. Um, the other is doing major investments in Audison. Uh, on that plan, we're doing an HVAC uh, rooftop replacement. Um, and for, there's been some issues with the elevators, uh, the elevator at the Audison, uh, and due to accessibility issues for our students with special needs, uh, we do need those el the elevator online. And so we have uh, requesting funds for the in, uh, additional investment and repair for the, the elevator, and then as well as a lift, purchasing a new lift for the school that will reach a, a particular area of that building, and as well as to improve safety at the Audison at, as uh, requesting additional funds for an exterior step repair. Uh, and so we're also looking to invest in our, as for funds for investing in the equipment for instructional purposes. Uh, these would be computers in the classroom that, that all students would use uh, and uh, faculty. Uh, and this is an annual request of about 400,000. And lastly, uh, one of the notable things is, as we talked about the playgrounds, we had, we had funds uh, allocated in the FY20 plan that were not sufficient. Uh, so this year we need additional funds to get these, these projects wrapped up after we have already invested time in designing and working with the community on getting these projects uh, completed. Uh, the Hardy playground for one is uh, the rear portion was originally implemented in 1991 and so the equipment is, there's not enough equipment there for the enrollment population that's using the equipment plus the community use. Um, uh, as well as the, the coding changes using a different kind of surface material that's substantially more expensive than using wood fibers uh, for safety purposes when children fall. That is also uh, the reason why, as well as moving a blacktop from the heating 
that would happen at happen at the Hardy Playground. Uh, if you have any questions in regards to those topics, uh, feel free to answer those. Are there any questions? In the school All programs. Right. All right. So okay. um, we had here is what I would call the things that keep us up at night. And um, we wanted to sort of, we've heard these before, but I want to sort of summarize them here and note that we don't have uh, solutions, but we are weighing the pros and cons and the costs and benefits and trying to figure out how we will address these. So uh, you heard from, from Joe and from, from Michael about playgrounds. And so we, we have both town and school playgrounds, and we have a sort of an informal division of, of payment for those with the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee, where the CPA um, is taking care of town playgrounds uh, for the most part, and we're taking care of school playgrounds. Um, as you've heard a couple times now, the bids for Hardy and Pierce came in uh, quite a bit higher than the initial estimates, uh, and that's a combination of uh, higher uh, code requirements plus escalating costs and uh, quite possibly um, increased demand in terms of what the features are. Um, so we have as one of our <coughs> to-dos to work together with the CPA as well as the schools and the recreation um, department to come to a meeting of minds on uh, two things really, uh, sort of a, a maximum reasonable renovation budget. Um, you know, you can ask for the moon, you can't always get the moon. Um, and also to really plan out the schedule for renovations that, and make sure that we're able to, we hope, keep within that budget, keep up with the playgrounds and not have them deteriorate in the process. Libraries, you heard about libraries. The, um, the renovation and rebuild costs are high. Um, and uh, you know, to get together with other major expenditures like the DPW, you know, it's already happened and will be a, a significant um, part of our, of our debt servicing going forward, um, the library costs would constrain the capital plan in the out years. Uh, and in, in particular, the Fox site is the one that, that, that's really uncertain for us right now. We're not sure about what's going to happen with the site. I mean, Robin, we're talking about a renovation. Fox is much more of a, you know, more like a, like a, a tear down and rebuild. And you know, it's currently a, a, a one story building. There's of course a lot of talk about zoning and uh, whether we, we would build you know, a multi-story building there, multi-use building, would it be housing, would it be uh, commercial? So that's very uncertain. That's part of why when Ido is talking about, you know, we don't even have a number, and it's in the out years beyond the five years of this plan. It, it, it may pop into the plan next year, but that's quite uncertain. But it would be a lot of money. DPW, we heard, you heard about the roads, and how the roads are um, re recommended $2 million per year, and we're not quite there yet, although we did increase it over our, our past practice. Um, you know, in theory, we need to find another $300,000 per year, which could, you know, conceivably be taken from lower priorities. That's, that's again, a, a, a prioritization question. That's some, some hard choices. The high school. The high school is not um, a direct impact on this budget because it's, it's, um, it's, uh, the exempt debt. Um, and our higher debt level is still within our, our state guidelines for what the town is allowed to or recommended to, to borrow. We don't see, and Phyllis, stop me if I'm wrong, but I don't, I have not heard anything about um, the current level of debt of, of, the, of the high school being likely to um, harm the town's credit rating or make our borrowing more expensive. Um, the likelier impact that we see to the capital plan, though, is because um, there had been some value um, engineering, as Angela mentioned, um, in order to keep us within our two, uh, $290.8 million cap. Uh, so for example, you probably heard that the bike path connector um, was removed. Um, the prioritization there was on uh, not impacting the educational mission, and so some of these other, you know, highly desirable, nice to haves, but ultimately cuttable things were cut. Um, I can imagine that uh, at some point we may hear some people coming to us and saying, could we find some money in the capital plan to restore the connector? So this is this something that we have to think about um, as a potential add in, in future years. 
And I mentioned Audison here as well. Um, this is likely to be the, the, the last school, uh, this, this is the last school that will need to be rebuilt. It, it, it was a renovation that was done in 98. Um, it's still very much showing its, its age. Michael mentioned that there's some, some uh, projects just to extend the useful life of the school into this decade and keep it safe. Um, but it will be uh, a, a big cost. It's going to be too expensive to finance within our plan, even with the MSBA contributing. Uh, that would be something that happens after the high school is done. We'll get back in line for MSBA, I, I believe. And we'll need a debt exclusion for that. Um, no direct impact to this plan, but it will add to the town debt. And I mention this because, you know, sort of in theory, if you need to go over the 5% rule, you can, so, so to speak, solve that by asking for debt exclusions. But in practice, we should stay within the 5% rule as, as much as we, we possibly can, because <coughs> we keep on burdening taxpayers with these exclusions, and it's getting tougher and tougher. So um, we have no solutions, but we're thinking about it. And we are very mindful of the growing demands and how it's tight to keep it all to fit inside the 5% rule. That inspiring uh, rundown. Take any questions. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, Bill. Um, <clears throat> Bill Keller. I wonder if you might address a little bit um, about uh, if you term the recent asymmetric jump in assessments. And the reason I ask is because uh, our subcommittee, finance subcommittee, uh, recently met with the assessor's office. And sort of my take is that there's always been an asymmetric nature to mm -hmm. assessments number of sales, how they're spread out in different districts. Mm -hmm. They can skew things one year, not another year. But I never really, uh, I'm not really familiar with the term recent asymmetric jump. Is there something recently that's happened that you point to? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I don't know that last year was exceptional, um, but I think there was a lot of perception that it was. A lot of people were talking about, oh, look, you know, um, for example, I, I happen to know that, that Kelvin Manor was particularly hard hit, apparently, and people saw their assessments going up by 20% or more. And you know, when the I think the average was something in the five to uh, five to 10% range, and so people seeing that well, and, and hearing that their friends across town had a zero percent uh, increase, I understand it, it, it's driven by you know property transactions, but people still see that and. You know, wonder if they're being um, hit harder, and, you know, and it can create friction within different parts parts of the town. That's all I'm talking about. Other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So just as uh, yes, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, wondering about, for example, road maintenance which, of course, virtually everybody in this town puts their car over these roads. Yeah. And this is just an observation without looking at it, but those seem to be essential. Libraries, especially maybe renovation of the Fox, mm -hmm. not quite as essential. Mm -hmm. So it's just an initial observation. So, for what it's worth. That's the reason the library uh, plans have been pushed back yeah. from what was originally requested. Yeah, I think the other reality with the roadways is that it's an easy, unfortunately, it's an easy thing to sort of right size because if you, you know, you can do 1.8, you can do 1.7, you can do two, in terms of what DPW you can put out, whereas a building, if it costs $8 million, it sort of costs $8 million, and so it's easier when we're balancing the plan, it's often easy to, easier to adjust things by, well, take a cut, on the roadways, and Instead that would not be the right thing to do, but it's it's a simpler adjustment to make. Instead of building uh, only 90% of a building, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, e it's easy to put off, and then you sort of end up with a Belmont exactly. situation. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't want to go there. <laughs> okay. One thing I was just going to throw out there, I don't know how we could do this, but um, in other towns, there are ways to bring in businesses that then pay taxes that then can be used to do development. Um, any of the places in Arlington, like maybe Poets Corner, that could be used, you know, to put office space. Have have we ever considered? I don't know. That's even the finance committee's place, or you know, just throwing it out there as an idea. Could we 
do, so I'm, I'm thinking of Burlington, because I'm in the education space, and I know that Burlington has an amazing high school, and it's because they have them all. So if we could bring in more tax dollars from the corporate space, we would solve some of our problems. I guess and I served on the master plan. I served on the master plan advisory committee and currently serve on the master plan implementation committee. And I, all I'd say is just that that was certainly a big topic of discussion for the, for the during the development of the master plan several years ago. And um, I think one of the two realities are that um, the town has limited developable space that's, you know, so even if people were willing to consider sort of rezonings that would, ena would enable that, it's still a very limited percentage of the town's uh, space and there's a lot of competing demands for that and then um, the the town does not have a differential tax rate for commercial versus residential obviously there's other reasons why commercial has different tax implications and different expense implications than additional residential but um, the ability to attract businesses um, that would generate the type of tax revenue was sort of felt to be challenged and particularly the there's only really one site, the Myrak site, that's large enough to really do a significant development on uh, at this point without sort of really looking at a sig really significant change in land use. The Mugar site. Well, the, well, the, the Mugar site was, I guess, is so challenged environmentally that we didn't actually consider that other than the proposal that's been put forward. Um, but like I said, in theory, again, it's an active use, but the, the and there's a lot of complexities to the ownership of that land, but the, you know, the Myrak site is large enough that if the dealership were to cease to be there or they decided to sell out, that's a large enough site to put, a, you know, significant mixed use development. Other than that, there aren't really any sort of contiguous sites uh, and the land assembly process would be extremely complicated for anything else. You, so, you mentioned Floyd's Corner and that's interesting is because that's one of the few sites I, I can think of that is easy to get to. That's another constraint that we have in our town is that, and I do this on my commute, and many of you may, may as well, trying to get in and out of the town from Route 2, uh, is challenging. Um, a couple of bottlenecks that we can go in and out of, and that makes attracting uh, new commercial development, even if we had sites for it, challenging. Okay, Brian. Um, personally, I think the roads are in abysmal condition. Um, would this committee? It's fair. Says the I, 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 so my eyes tell me one thing. And my ears tell me something different. It's on a curve. Yeah. Um, would this committee um, support um, a specific override on an annual basis for three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars a year to get to that number, two million dollars? Because I think that would people would vote for that in a second. And it's small, it's short change. So we haven't taken a formal vote as a committee. I would certainly raise it at our next meeting, for example. Yes. Belmont, which probably has the worst roads in the state, <laughs> put forth an override for exactly that. I can't remember the exact cost, but to literally rebuild the roads. Right. It failed. failed. <laughs> we used to do it in Hamilton for $1 million a year. And it, uh, it passed every single year. There was never an issue. Because people know what it was for and they support, you know, in general they support it. Okay, any other questions? Shine? Sorry, one more parochial question as a resident of Lake Street. Um, I think at the beginning you talked about like the, the Lake Street sort of lighting or, or so there I think a couple years ago there was a plan for the bike path and where yeah, there's like well, one of the items that um, <coughs> is, was on our, our currently in progress this year from and coming out of last year's uh, capital plan is to uh, how should I say do something about that uh, intersection um, between the bike path and, and Lake Street uh, with a new signal. Yes. Okay. Peter, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I think that your, your committee should think a little bit about using the uh, boasting about the 5% rule. The actual amount of money being spent on uh, on uh, 
buildings is, is much more than 5% uh, because it's uh, exempt. Um, so when you say 5%, some people will say, how can that be? Mm -hmm. and you explained it very carefully what you mean by it, but I don't think the bottom line comes across as honestly as it might. Something to think about. In other words, what are we actually spending? Including the exempt money? Yeah. Interesting. Sometime when you have nothing else to do, you might want to run that calculation just for curiosity. But okay, any other questions? Yeah. I've been harping on this a little bit, uh, so I'll ask Sandy and Phyllis, that uh, prior exempt debt has sort of, will be coming down over a period of time. And at one point, it might even be this year or the next year, it drops a bit more. And so I just want to be sh reassured that you're going to fill up that drop uh, when you when you do your bonding, so it's 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 as smooth as possible. We are considering that. I mean, it is. We are watching. Okay. <laughs> um, we don't want to have spikes. Yeah, we don't want it down and then back up again. Right. Even if you if you sell a van and then pay it off, you could fill up that hole. Yes, we're watching the structure. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Charlie. Uh, yes, I think there's an answer to Peter's uh, question about uh, how much is, is spent uh, on example. If you go back to the reconciliation of town budget slide that uh, on page 10 that Sandy addressed, the uh, <clears throat> second line down, or, so is the adjustment for exempt debt service. Yep. So that's the, that's the amount that's being spent against exempt borrowing on, a, on an annual basis. And it runs, uh, stuck this year it's 4 million, it's going to go down to 3 million in fiscal year 225, not including the high school. So um, that's, if you, if you think back to the, uh, there's another slide there where that uh, Timber was talking about where we have approximately a $10 million a year spend. Okay? It's about 30% uh, uh, more. That's exactly that's spent. Which is negative. Not negative. I think to the general public that would be considered not negative. I didn't say it was negligible. I'm just saying that it's on the slide. It's not something that is not available. Yes, but I know. It's, I, I think Peter's point is it's, it's not spelled out as we have a 5% rule and then we have an additional, doing the math in my head, 1.5% that's going to pay for, pay, pay for this stuff too. But that's. Mm -hmm paid for, I mean, that's, that's out there because the voters vote yes, for Yes, exactly. It. I mean, it's so, not so something that the town meeting right. has, has laid on yeah. the town. It, what, what, uh, what I was saying before on the issue slide was that so, so the, the safety valve, so to speak, is to say, well, we have too many requests here and it doesn't all fit in the 5% rule. Is there the political will to uh, have an override, uh, excuse me, a debt exclusion to, um, to pay for that? And, and we, we have done that particularly for the schools. Um, there's no way you could possibly fit the, the high school into this plan. <coughs> um, but you know, it, but it does mean that the costs are you know, uh, not just the five foot rule. Yeah. Okay, John. <coughs> to Peter's point about communicating to the public about actual spends, mm -hmm. I think maybe when you're communicating about the cost of playgrounds now basically doubling um, you could communicate to town meeting members and put that at the feet of the unfunded mandate that the state passed to use these new surfaces because I was pretty closely involved in the Hardy School development and uh, you know what you said is exactly right the capital planning had a had a figure in their head and then there's a new mandate that you have to use these surfaces and everything doubled uh, because wood chips aren't apparently good enough anymore so you know, the state's creating these regulations. The town is, the town taxpayers are, are paying for it. So, um, you know, to the extent that people in town meeting are politically active and need to let their representatives know that if they're going to pass requirements that we have to double the cost of every playground, they might want to consider providing funding to help us do that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, Annie. Um, <coughs> if we 
thought about the possibility of figuring out whether or not there's a good rule of thumb for what percent of, like, like what should be a rule of thumb about the max exempted debt service we ought to have? Am I making any sense? Yeah, you are. Okay, um, because there's other projects besides the schools <coughs> that the debt exclusion might make sense for if we could explain our philosophy about it. I think the 5% rule on capital, <coughs> it's easy to explain that to a resident who says, well, why don't we just not buy police cars? The answer is, look, we need to invest a certain amount, da da da. We limit it, even in good years, it doesn't go over this, and in bad years, you know, we have some flexibility, da da. We had a similar rule about exempt debt service, we could figure out something that makes sense. It might be an easy way to explain to people how projects roll on and off of that yeah. list. Um, and then I have one other thought for you, which is that um, I think the Fox Library is a place where the idea of public-private partnership really makes a lot of sense. And there are many, many, many nonprofit affordable housing developers, not just HCA, but larger organizations who would be great partners for this kind of thing and wouldn't see a library on the first floors of birth. So just food for thought. Yeah, it, it, it's been raised in a very, I would say, nebulous way so far, because we're so far out from getting any details on that. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we get closer to that, and, and as, as studies progress, we'll probably get there but we're not there yet. Charlie? Um, I, I would just like to make a comment about the idea of an annual override uh, for uh, capital purposes or whatever. It, it's my experience that overrides suck up a tremendous amount of volunteer energy. And, and as a result, and, and oftentimes, as Alan mentioned before, in certain towns, they are unpredictable. And one of the objectives of the capital planning process is predictability and, and uh, having the town uh, management and staff have expectations that they think can be fulfilled as they plan ahead. So I am very skeptical about that idea. Uh, I wasn't thinking of actually holding over override every year, but just of having a number in our head that is, you know, like if we, at peak out at say six million dollars a year of exempt debt service as that rolls off in our own thinking be thinking about okay the next project that comes along that can't be done within the five percent well we have a little capacity here that won't be seen as a huge jump in taxes since taxes are coming down <coughs> I don't know I, it's a, a very unformed thought but it's not the idea of an annual override okay. Charlie well, at all just it's more like a capacity in, in limit. last year last year's capital report if my memory serves me right, yeah. there is a, it's either the last year or the year before, there is a forecast of, it, of mm -hmm. exempt debt service mm -hmm. uh, and the impact of the high school on that. Mm -hmm. and, and that um, says that when the high school comes on, uh, there's not going to be any roll off for a long time. Right. Yeah, it's a big number. Okay. okay, any other comments or? Uh, Okay, so you're going to be asking right, let me to... Uh, let me just page ahead to the, to the treasurer's uh, portion here. So here. And full screen. Okay. So uh, first we need to do talk about uh, prior borrowing. So over, over to Phyllis. Uh, so the items that are listed on this slide for um, that we're asking town um, meeting to... Um, consider sending authorization for. Um, the first two are from last, uh, they were requested last year in the capital plan. The um, boilers for the rink. And that structure was based on direction that we had received from the recreation department that those boilers were in need of repair sooner rather than later. Um, and when the facilities department met with recreation this year in terms of in prior to the bond issue that we did, um, it was determined that those boilers could last probably another three years or more. So um, we um, 
are asking that the uh, town meeting consider rescinding that authorization and then we will incorporate it into a future capital plan. The second item, um, the 125000 was uh, it was determined that that project wasn't as well defined as we thought it was and so we are removing that from the capital plan and so we're asking that you um, support our request of town meeting to rescind that amount as well. And the big ticket item, um, the million dollars is what remains from the authorization for the Stratton uh, school renovation. You may remember from last year's town meeting that um, we moved some money from the uh, modular portion to pay for the, that was remaining from the modular borrowing and we used that to pay for the cost which um, left for the cost of Stratton renovation. So that left a million dollars that we no longer need to borrow. And so we would ask that town meeting to send that authorization as well. Okay. I just have to ask, as a Stratton parent, long time Stratton parent, did the entire Stratton project happen and there, those modulars just cost a million dollars less than we expected? Is this is happened? not from the modulars um, and the that was, it was just money that remained in the modular, so I don't, I don't have the number off the top of my head. It wasn't, um, I don't remember from last year, um, but we moved, I thought it was around 100,000 um, um, from the modulars to pay for the Stratton renovation. And this money has not been borrowed, and it was determined that we didn't need to borrow it. So oh, I see. So like 100,000 from the modulars went to the project and that the money that was authorized just wasn't needed for the project. Right. Got it. <laughs> okay, John? Um, the 150 that you think you'll need to spend in three years for the rink boiler, that wasn't on the capital plan that I saw. You only had two items for the rink. 150. Last, last year. Right. And you didn't spend it, but you just said, we do think, we didn't have to spend it last year, but we do think we might have to spend it in like three years. Possibly. So. It's, it's not on is there a reason for that? Was just an oversight or what? Uh, uh, I don't think it was oversight as much as um, we're hoping that it, we will have a better definition of what kind of boilers are needed and the numbers that we had just didn't make sense. So instead of changing the number and estimating three years out, we wanted to bring a number that was meaningful in terms of what actually was required to meet the need. Wasn't one of those boilers already replaced, though, a few years ago? When Joe was still here, I'm pretty sure they replaced one of them. There were, there were some that were replaced. I don't know if these are them or not. Um, these were requested, and in fact, these may have been those boilers. If I think there was one that they felt like they had the wrong type of boiler in there, like it was a residential boiler and not a commercial grade boiler. Yeah. Hence the reason we need real numbers that are meaningful. Yeah, I think the uh, between the turnover at the recreation department and the facilities department, I think there may have been some confusion about what was really needed, and we seem to have come to the conclusion that for the short term we don't need to do anything and we'll reevaluate, like Phyllis said. So town management and the recreation department are fine with rescinding this issue? Yes. Okay. Any other questions just on the uh, rescission of prior borrowing? Okay. Okay. Now, pay for bridge. So, um, this is the punch slide. Um, we, um, as Sandy referenced in the, I think, slide one of the first slides that he went over for us, um, that we have cash remaining from some projects um, we, that we are using to build this capital budget. Uh, we also have some money that remains from bond issues that were um, actually borrowed. And those projects have closed out. Um, and so the total we're asking uh, to reappropriate is 1,116,048 
Last year, we asked for a reappropriation for borrowed money that was 872000 and um, so we're asking again that you approve this, and I'm going to walk through the slides that show how we're going to um, recommend it, because as you may recall, we are required to map um, reappropriation of borrowed funds so that they match the same term or longer. And you can't let cash just sit there. That's right. Questions? So um, on the next slide, um, we have the, uh, the total of $258,411. And those are um, projects that we had um, borrowed. Uh, as you can see, the um, meeting date for these authorizations are listed here. And um, those are grouped that way because we are um, We'll skip forward to the to the next page. Um, we're look, looking to use some of the most of that money for sidewalk and ramp construction, and um, so the fourth slide is where we're, we're showing these uh, amounts to be reused. Um, and uh, the the next group that equals the four hundred seventy two thousand nine sixty four are um, buildings. Wait, wait. So, so, so just to make sure I'm on the right slide. Slide three now. Yes, yep, I'm yep. backing, I'm yep, flipping yep. between three and four, I'm yep. sorry. It's okay. Um, so those are grouped um, because those are buildings that we, um, that are uh, more than 20 years, and so um, we grouped that amount of money so that we could map it easily to um, light issues. Um, the light issues are the Woodmore Robins cupola, and yeah, four. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm on four. Sorry. The Roof, the Parmenter HVAC upgrade, which I think Sandy referenced, and uh, the uh, community center construction. They had originally asked for an additional appropriation of two hundred fifty thousand, and so we're going to use this these bond proceeds that we're remapping to pay for those instead of borrowing them. Um, and the, the last group is, is the last, the Thompson is separate because that's an exempt project that was um, voted and so we have to use that money on another exempt project or we have to talk to the state about adjusting our um, schedules to the DOR. So, um, and since we have a need at the uh, high school, that's where we would like to recommend um, a vote for you and for the town. Okay. I'm assuming that if I take all those numbers, that equals uh, 1,116,048.95. Yes, sir, it does. Okay. Okay, questions on this? Round it to the nearest penny. Absolutely. <laughs> we want to close these accounts out and be able to spend the, the more time we want. Okay, I think what I'd like to do now is actually discuss and vote on these two issues, because otherwise we're just piling, you know, one thing on another that gets, can get confusing. So if we could go back to the three rescission items and just briefly discuss and vote on those and then go to the next one and, and take those one at a time. Dean? I move that we vote favorable action on the rescission of $1,275,000 of prior borrowing as shown on slide 38 and up there. Second. <laughs> Second. Okay, that's moved and seconded. Is there any questions at all or any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of rescission of those uh, three items, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so unanimous. 3, 4, 20. Okay, now let's take the reapportionment. Uh, I, I, I mentioned to Phyllis, and I assume it's been 10 years now, but uh, cash cannot just, especially borrowed cash, cannot just sit there under federal. It's got to go through. So. At this point, we're looking 
to take 1,116,048.95 of cash that has already been borrowed, correct? Yes, that's correct. And reapportion it towards those items at the at the bottom of page 21. Dean. I move that the sum of 1,116,048.95 be transferred from amounts previously appropriate and borrowed under the articles shown on slides 39, 40, so from 39, 40, 41 to the amount shown on slide 42. Second. Second. Discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, that's great. By the way, Phyllis, I've always meant to ask you if, if you finally got the, your office straightened out after <laughs> taking it over from your predecessor. <laughs> We're very organized. Okay. We had a good start. <laughs> okay, and... Uh, yes. Phyllis. Oh, Phyllis. Um, I... I um, so sort of calling out a turn here, but um, there is an article that is on the draft warrant for authorization and an appropriation of bond premiums. Can I speak to you about that? It's un I'm prepared to talk about it now, but I know the capital planning committee's report is not. Okay. Um, can we just finish with the capital and then yes, that would be fine. Um, now, the transfer of $10,000 from perpetual care, if I remember correctly, we already voted that last time. Peter? Well, we'll take care of it anyway. So, Dan? I move that we vote to transfer $10,000 from perpetual care to the capital budget. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we might have just done it twice, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so now we have the recommended vote. Yes. Okay. So, Sandy, hey, slide 44. But you should all have a, uh, a new handout. have a handout, a single page handout that looks like this. Oh. Which replaces. As the night goes on, the numbers just get smaller. Anybody can do it with three or four slides. Fellas, but we're going to do it with one. So, um, what uh, what goes on with your authorization vote is um, that you are saying that we are going to authorize um, repayment of. Uh, otherwise known as debt service for all the, the bonds that we have issued or uh, anticipate issuing in the coming year in FY21. And if you look at um, that number, um, on the middle of the page here, it is $13,436,932 of general fund um, debt service. Uh, We've broken out this vote differently from the way it's been broken out in past years. Uh, in past years, everything was all jumbled together and then sort of disaggregated in a way that many of us found uh, challenging. So what we did on this sheet is we, in the top section, had what water and sewer debt is, that's voted in the water and sewer debt budget. Rink, that's voted in the rink budget. Recreation debt, that's voted in, in the Recreation Enterprise Fund budget, and then general fund is what you're voting tonight. The other number that you're voting on tonight is near the bottom of the page, the $4,329,512 in cash. That is part of the cash that makes up the 5%. And I just wanted to point out, uh, maybe for Peter's, benefit because we referenced it a, no, a previous slide before. Ida and I worked to reconcile these numbers over the last couple of days because we realized that um, the way the chart used to read and mush things up a certain way didn't work anymore and we had to come up with new numbers. 
the other thing is that uh, this capital plan, I told you before, we take snapshots in time. And the snapshot that we took to build this was from the fall. But we had to update that when Phyllis sold debt in December. This re reflects that new updated amount of debt, exempt debt, uh, really mostly. Uh, and that's why, Peter, if, if you compare the amount of debt that is exempt debt, uh, the information you have on that five-year chart is outdated. We're glad, happy to give you new updated information if you want to do any calculations. But I just wanted to point out, if you're looking at old handouts and new handouts, that's why the numbers are different. The bottom line is, in order for us to have the legal authority to spend this money to repay our debt and to buy things with cash, we need your vote on these two numbers. So, the only two numbers that we need to specifically vote on is the general fund debt appropriation, which will include all debt, exempt and non-exempt, and the cash, 4329000 Correct. Correct. Okay. And you and Alan are going to have this all straightened out with the whole budget by April 15th. Absolutely. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, questions? Peter. I guess that means that the, the budget's going to reflect this this kind of uh, tally? Uh, yes, it will. Good idea. <clears throat> Other questions? Brian. Um, what's the capital carry forward line of a million ninety seven? Uh, that is uh, some of that, that reappropriated money, the reused money, both uh, reused cash and reused um, prior debt authorization. Is that in, in any relation to what we just voted? Uh, yes. It's within that part of that 1097 is some of the... Uh, that money that you just voted. Okay, so we're going to have the total debt mm -hmm. and the total cash, and then uh, we're going to vote those numbers because that's what we're actually going to spend. And then we'll have further, say, down minus this, 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 including carryover and such for a net impact on the town budget, <coughs> um, which will fit into the whole picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Dean? Oh, I move that the Finance Committee approve the um, fiscal year 2021 capital budget as described by Sandy Cooler, as shown on our handouts, and also as shown on the screen. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, discussion, questions? This is why we spend a whole day on this book, because it gets a little complex sometimes, but it is critical. Okay, all motions been made and seconded. Basically, we're voting this page, but the key numbers are the dark, uh, darkened numbers for total debt and total cash. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, favorable action, unanimous, 3420. Okay, uh, any other questions? you? want to ask the capital budget, Dean? So it's not a question. It's not really a motion to vote on midweek and clap. But um, so obviously we have new leadership on the capital planning committee, which means we have retired leadership on the capital planning committee. And um, Charlie has been the only chair I've ever known on the capital planning committee. And I do want to say thanks to Charlie for his many years of service as both a member and a chair of the capital planning committee. Um, his, you know, tireless advocacy for sound capital planning policies and practices, you know, which led to us meeting the needs of residents in all sorts of different ways through capital planning. And then most importantly, it's just tired advocacy at times over the years of both exempt and non-exempt spending 
when we needed it. So, you know, we're not going to vote. I'm going to clap. But thank you, Charlie, for your years of service. Thank you so much. Second the motion. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie. I'd like to move that we vote to endorse the uh, five year capital plan presented by the capital plan. Second. Any discussion? I want to buy next time. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That is done. Which, by the way, since you, we haven't spoken about that, that's the next page. Because you all. In case you haven't seen enough numbers, you've also received attachments that include the entire detailed capital plan. So thank you for, for reviewing that as well. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you. And thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for the work that you do. Um, it, is, it is very much appreciated. And all of you may leave, except for Phyllis, of course. <laughs> she has to stay. She has to stay. And you're welcome to stay, too. I'm <laughs> Now, uh, Phyllis, which article are you interested in? Article 56. <laughs> oh, 56. Yeah. You could all take out your warrants. Authorization appropriation bond premiums. Okay. So this article is before uh, you and for town meeting. Um, because in our um, preparation of the special town meeting article last year to approve the high school, um, we, as you, many of you know, the MSBA is very, very particular about the wording of these articles, and so um, that was the, that's the module that we got, that's the uh, format that we got. Um, they require all kinds of particular phrases um, relative to the relationship and the contract and the funding and the grant. And uh, so, um, in that process, uh, even though many, many people looked at that article, uh, we missed the phrase or the paragraph that allocates uh, the pr premiums associated with the borrowing to be used to pay for that project. So this uh, article is to, um, uh, we have sold $56 uh, million um, the, um, for the first phase of the high school construction and design. So, um, and we had a premium of $2,967,000 um, that remained, uh, that we received from the sale of those bonds. And um, so they're in a reserve account um, pending a vote by town meeting to use that to help pay for the project. So it would reduce the, um, Authorization of the two uh, hundred and ninety million eight fifty one, <coughs> and we'll also apply to any the rest of the borrowings that we are going to um, execute. So um, it's a housekeeping measure, and um, it's that's why it's before you. Team, I move favorable action on Article Fifty Six. Second. Second. Any discussion? Questions? Premiums used to be very simple, but <laughs> they're not anymore. Okay, uh, if no further questions. All those in favor of favorable action on Article 56, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so could I be correct that we can take this Warren article, rephrase it, vote it that, and we'd be in good shape? And take out the or any action related there too? Okay. 
Uh, that is the action. So I thank you for your vote. I appreciate okay. It. Thank you very much. Appreciate your staying. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Timor, yes. could you, when you have your whole vote put together, which <laughs> yes. includes all the different sections, uh, could you get it to Wiz? Email it to Wiz so she can insert it. If you could do it uh, the next two or three weeks? Sure. Okay, appreciate it. Very much appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Okay, now on Monday, Minuteman is coming, and they sent us uh, materials. And if you have any questions on those materials, could you shoot them to Annie? And she could shoot them to the superintendent so he can prepare some answers. Now, one question I'd like, now I just skimmed through it, so maybe I just missed it. But when, this, when they had all the enrollments mm -hmm. for next fiscal year, it came to 658 students yep. versus 628, which was the yep. um, planned enrollment or yep. planned building capacity. Now, that still includes some students who are left off, left over from out of district. That includes Belmont. That includes the six towns that pulled out. So what I'd like to see is a projection <coughs> as that whole thing goes forward. And I can't remember if he did this, but if those, if the current member towns, which I think are nine, if we take out Belmont, project those ahead and see if we still have a full building. Because those out of districts are going away, Belmont's going away, the six towns are going away. Are we still going to have a full I, building? I can, I can answer part of that question. I will get actual data for you. But okay. Based on my discussion with the superintendent, for example, the freshman incoming class is oversubscribed. They've had more applicants than they'll be able to take. They will be taking no out of district students into the freshman class. Okay. And they may be turning away in district students, wow. depending. Yes. So. He feels he will be able to fill that building to over capacity with in-district placements going forward. Okay. And he's basing that on projections of the size of eighth grade classes across the district going forward. But I'll, I'll tell him we should be prepared I to show that. I just see that projected yeah, out. Absolutely. Because um, <coughs> remember, I asked the question, what happens if we get all these students? <coughs> And he basically said the 628, which is the building capacity, I could put more kids in there. Yeah, <coughs> I think he can, but I don't think he can put. How many more? I don't know, but maybe Not seven. Not as many as he thinks he could get enrolled. Okay. He's frustrated that we only built 628 person. So if anybody has any more questions like that or anything else, shoot them to Annie. Uh, he's coming in on Monday. See if you can get them to Annie by, you know, Friday, Friday morning or something. I have a quick question. Sure. You can just, I could sure. just verbalize it. Um, could he comment on whether there are restrictions based on staffing? Like, does he not have the budget to hire the teachers? If he, no, totally space. Space. Okay. Space. Okay. Yeah. He's already got plans to make some small expansions for some programs. Okay. okay. Because I was thinking, like, oh, if, even if I could get the space, like, you would need to appropriate this much money so I can get the teachers. No, that that doesn't seem to be his problem. Okay, this was a. Uh, I'd like to take the minutes. Um, now, now, I'm sorry, when, when is the Minuteman material? Monday. They're coming Monday. They, they sent it out last day. We got it at 9 30. I didn't know that. We got it tonight. No, the agenda. I can see what the I don't, know, I don't think we got it yet. I don't think we got it yet. I think I got it this afternoon. Liz, did you send it out or did I? I didn't get it. Annie, did you send it? I have not sent it yet, but I have it and I will send it. <laughs> okay. I might have been just on the list of the first people to get it. So, uh, so if you can make sure that gets yes, shut out. Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, okay, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, minutes. Do I have any corrections of the minutes? Dean. Yeah, on Article 7, 
um, retirement, the last sentence. Paragraph, paragraph seven. Sorry, yeah, seven, retirement. It says there is some concern with the increased number of teachers. So it's, it's, the in, it's actually the increased number of school support staff because the teachers go into the mass teachers retirement system. The support staff comes to the town pension. I think teachers' aides are also so under the pension know, system, but I'm, that's what I meant by support staff. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so Peter, just cross off teachers and say school support staff. Good, thank you. Okay. Um, any others? Okay, I just got a couple. Under paragraph eight, I think you could cross off uh, the last sentence generally based on real time. I think you could cross off that last line because it's said it again after the court verifies the practice of other towns. So it's, it's just redundant. So cross off generally based on real time internet research. <coughs> You see what I mean here? Yeah, I, I know what you mean, and I understand, but I don't see the wording. Okay, article of uh, paragraph eight. Yeah. The last line, the last two lines, generally starts with generally. Oh, I, I see. Just cross the cross that and members off. Okay. Paragraph eleven. Paragraph 11, third line, will continue to be made up from, you've got two froms. It's really from. <laughs> <laughs> got it, thank you. Okay, and then on the line before at the end, it says until then, the policy will continue. I think it's clearer if you say until then, cross off policy and saying the OPEB funding will continue to be made up from the three sources. Okay, they on, on the paragraph 16. It it's next. Uh, next no. meeting. Day afternoon. <laughs> Next, next meeting is Wednesday the 4th, not Monday. Thank you. Okay, any other corrections? Arif? On 5, 6, and 7, uh, my name is spelled incorrect. And so is Finna. Hmm? Six, 5, 6, 7. Is that fine? Information technology is I'm missing an I. Oh no, the whole thing is wrong. The whole thing is wrong. A R I. I'll try harder. Sorry about no, no, that. No problem. Okay. Any other corrections? Do I have a motion on the minutes? So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Minutes are approved. Uh, okay. On Monday we will have. Um, Minuteman will be in, and we'll be taking a voting on that, and then that usually takes about half. So hopefully uh, we can finish up some more Warren articles, and uh, we can take care of more budgets. So any other business? Meeting adjourned.